It was my final psychiatry rotation in medical school, and my job was to tell an Iraq veteran about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I was picturing a very large man, much larger than me, who might have been confused about his condition. I thought he might want to look for me as an authority, because I was the one wearing a white coat, and I would be in charge of medications that would change his brain chemistry. So I put a stethoscope on for this encounter, and I actually deepened my voice. <laughs> and when I walked in that room, I found out that this Iraq veteran was a greater authority on PTSD yeah. than I could hope to be. Yeah. First of all, she had the lived experience of the hell of war, but she also had come armed with four papers that she'd printed, academic journal articles. These were things she had paid $40 a piece for, because publicly funded research is not always available to the public for free. She also had to look up jargon like non-inferiority and statistical significance in order to find out what these journal articles were about. And I came out of that meeting, first of all, very well schooled in the ins and outs of PTSD at a personal level, but also a scientific level, because she had the chops a little bit more than I did. <laughs> But I was also bothered by the way we treat patients, sometimes in a passive role where, where the authority is the doctor and the patients are recipients. Yeah. So, yeah. so I chewed on this, and I have a background in film and magazine writing, and one thing I noticed about all these journal articles, and the reason I didn't know those ones that well, is that they're very, very boring. <laughs> it's like watching paint peel. I mean, you tried reading about statistical significance and non-inferiority and keep your eyes open at 4 a.m. So a crazy idea came to me. I would make reports on new research in psychiatry, explaining it in everyday language. And I would explain it with the help of patients, patients like this veteran. This would, first of all, help me develop my teaching abilities, and it would also allow people to hear voices that are not always heard, the voices of the patients. I set up video cameras in a field, and I began recording people, inviting them to talk about depression and anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and suicide. And people lined up in a spirit much like we have tonight, being vulnerable, sharing, and helping me understand their lived experience. The voice and the authority of lived experience is so excluded, and the medical community is so starved of it that I had these, truthfully, very low production value videos, yes. and I was able to sell them to medical news outlets aimed at doctors. And the contracts that I now have say that I can produce as many as possible, as fast as possible, which was a feather in my cap in a way. I asked my friends, what am I doing so well that I can teach? And more and more the feedback is, really, you're fine at teaching, but less of you and more of the people with lived experience, more of the people with conditions that are relevant, people who are the end user of the therapies that we're funding in this research. And I took this advice, and I continue to make these. The production values are getting better, but I'm getting less interested in my ability to teach, and more interested in something totally new. I want to revolutionize the way that mental health publishing is done, elevating the voices of people with lived experience. And I hired a science writer with lived experience to summarize clinical trials in readable language, make it engaging, take the passive voice out, take words like non-inferiority and just explain what it means. And he's done that. And we have funding agencies that are interested. We have partners in hospitals and in the private sector who have expressed an interest in revolutionizing the way we publish so that the end users, the people whose public funds are used to produce these results, that these people get to see what's done in their name and for their benefit. <laughs> to do this, to do this, I want to change the way peer review is done. Peer review should be done by people who have lived experience. I want to teach people who have lived experience of, let's say, bipolar disorder to review the latest research about bipolar disorder. Assessing the statistical validity, yes, just the way they do when they decide what gets entry into a journal, but also assessing these articles in terms of impact and relevance to patients. Yeah. So why is this important? 
I'm going to close by telling you about the very first video that changed my mind and helped me know why it was that these patients had something more to say than I did. I did a report on suicide and veterans. It was found that at a psychiatric urgent care clinic, veterans would fill out surveys saying that they were suicidal 50% of the time that they would walk in the door. But then they double-checked the psychiatrist's notes, and the psychiatrist's notes said, the veterans were only suicidal 21% of the time. So why the mismatch? Why were veterans not being forthcoming? Why did they not feel emboldened to talk to their psychiatrists? I talked to the commander of VFW 8486 here in Madison, Carolyn, and she said that her problems leading to feeling suicidal stemmed from the men in the military. And who were the psychiatrists? Men employed by the military. Then I talked to another man named Hovey, who was known as the sense of humor of this place, and they said he won't even keep a straight face. But he got deadly serious, and he told me he's, his problem, and the reason that he would feel tempted to mislead psychiatrists is he felt there was a conflict of interest, that they get reimbursed, paid at a higher rate for pills, whereas he might want therapy. He has nightmares, take a pill for that. Feelings of sadness, there's a pill for that as well. He thought, I'd like to talk to a person because there may be a less invasive measure and he didn't trust it 100%. And finally, there was another man who keeps a Vietnam museum in his basement. And he said, who are you? You're a kid. You went to school for 15 years. And you're an authority on the hells of war. You see a guy with his buddy blown up. And you sitting in a chair, you're going to tell me what to do about seeing the horrors of war. And he said, recruit some psychiatrists from the ranks of the military. Otherwise, people will tell them nothing. So I leave you with these anecdotes, and I invite you to look at brainsplain.org, where we maintain a library of all of our work, videos, and reviews of the research. And I also invite you to contact me at mcampbell at gmail.com if you would like to be a reporter or a person interviewed about any psychiatric condition, or if you would like to be trained to review scientific articles, because I'm looking for people with lived experience to elevate that authority. Thank you.